भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय वेलकम एवरीबडी वॉन्डरबुल सी यू ऑल सो वी आर कैन फिनिश अप दी सेवन चैप्टर टुडे Looks like we're on text 29. Um as far as a little bit of um warm up and and recap the 7th chapter really switches um the tone of the Gita. There's a there's a real market shift and we move from you know the text which would be um you know right at home amidst buddhist literature or taoist literature or stoic literature talking about uh, being detached from doing your duty i can't see you so you got to move yeah all right better Oh, good. Um we go from a text which is talking about doing your duty, being detached, being zen. There's also some spirituality involved. You're not the body, that you are a soul. and then it switches Did you just dive into your couch Rudy? I saw that, dude. I just I just jumped onto the bed. I saw that. I saw that. Um You know, you go from the Gita being a piece of stoic Taoist Buddhist literature very generic dealing with subjects like the nature of self the world being detached being beyond dualities being zen and then there's a shift now you know it's true like if you get into stoicism they don't necessarily talk about spirituality and like that you are the soul and not the body if you get into buddhism they don't necessarily talk about you're the soul and not the body or taoism for that matter those three philosophies have you know i think the majority of them are actually atheistic to be quite honest and so um not even monistic necessarily that there's an impersonal absolute but that you know they don't necessarily even ask those questions about the, the ultimate nature of all reality that you're a part of they they're much more imminent philosophies that deal in, in this worldly terms which is strange because you have this idea of the the super zen buddhist monk but then if you dig in philosophically what do you believe what happens to you at the time of death then they tell you where they're at um so the gita would differ from those traditions in that it had a a real strong idea that you are consciousness the consciousness is not material the consciousness is eternal that therefore you are, you are eternal the stuff like that that's there in the first six chapters which do make it a spiritual text which do make it a uh yeah it's fundamentally different but a lot of the concern of the gita for the first six chapters is about how to be in this world but not of it and uh then there's a shift in the beginning of the seventh chapter and you get into a theology the gita becomes a theological text where god becomes an indispensable part of reality now that if you believe in a deity then that becomes a indispensable fundamental 
affects every decision, affects every truth. Primary centrifugal force in your philosophy. If you believe in God, that point, that single point becomes a hinge that everything, a fulcrum that everything else moves around. So there are certain versions of, of theism, uh, oftentimes known under the name deism, which is a term which is used in a variety of ways. But there are types of theism um, that are deistic, that believe that God creates the world but really has nothing to do with it. And in fact, you find strains of this in, in Vedic thought, in some early Vedic thought, there's a school of Vedic thought called Mimamsa. We're actually a part of that school. We're a, um, we're a, um, Mimamsa 2.0. We're a uh, Ramamsa Redux. We're a, kind of like a a second iteration. Of Mimangsa. Mimangsa was a, a school of Vedic hermeneutics that considered the Vedic texts to be aparsheya. They were not created by man and they were um, nitya, they were eternal. And the words of the Veda were the fundamental building blocks of all reality. And you get statements by Mimangsa because if there is a God, and you follow the Veda, then that God has to reward you accordingly. So God now becomes a secondary feature with the Veda and the sacred Sanskrit texts being the primary feature of reality. And if there's a God, then that God has to follow the rule of the Veda. And if you follow Veda and you do your duty, then that God has to provide for you. Does that make sense? So um, that gets into some interesting discussion, like, you know, the nature of God. Can God do anything? Can God act against his nature? We see the nature, the, the, the nature, that the world, the universe in which we live, is logical and reasonable, and things follow rules, and there's order. And usually if you know first conditions, you can then understand what's going to happen if you know enough of them. So, of course, if the world was created by God and it was created in an orderly way, that would indicate that the deity that created that world also possessed those features of orderliness and logic. And you get this whole euthyphro dilemma that, you know, uh, you know, is goodness above God is what ultimately boils down to, or is logic above God, but if God is logos, which is what the, actually the Bible says, the book of James, uh, the book of John, and the being was Logos, and Logos was Theos. Then if God is, is logic personified, then for God to behave logically is just to behave according to his own nature. And you get into things like, you know, can God make a stone so heavy he can't lift it? And these other sort of nonsensical questions. Um, uh, that just get dispensed with when you make the point that when you say God's omnipotent, it means that God can do any, everything that's logically possible. But, you know, if, 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 if you can't just say, I can God create a gobbledygook? Well, what's a gobbledygook? I don't know. I just made it up. Well, then I don't know if God can create a gobbledygook because it doesn't really exist. It's just word salad. So uh, within philosophy, theology, um, it's not always considered to be a fault to put a limitation on what omnipotence means and not to take omnipotence to be absurdity and to allow for there to be reasonable, logical limitations placed on an omnipotent being that would be in congruence with the nature of that being. So it wouldn't be possible for God to act against his own nature because that would just be like saying, could you not be yourself? Did you guys follow that? Okay, let me say it again. I don't, I don't want to deal with this, but we're, we're going to deal with it because I, I also don't feel like I made perfect sense there. Um, sometimes when people are talking about the omnipotence of the deity 
they then challenge that by coming up with some absurd thing like, can God make a square circle? Well, a square circle doesn't exist because a square by its very definition has edges and a circle by its very definition does not. Therefore, to say, can God make a square circle is really just saying, can God make something which doesn't, is fundamentally impossible to exist? It's a contradiction in terms. It's not just something that would require a powerful individual. It's something which is logically impossible and just simply a contradiction in terms. Therefore, it doesn't have any meaning. Just because you can say, can God go up, down? Like, like what, what do you mean when you say that? There's some responsibility that attends to the person making the challenge. They can't just make a challenge that's literally a contradiction in terms. They have to come up with something which an omnipotent being would be able to do, not something which is just simply impossible and either a contradiction in terms or logically unreasonable and impossible. You follow? Okay. If God's nature was to be good and orderly, and you can say, well, can God be unorderly? You could reasonably say no, because God's nature is to be good and orderly. Therefore, if the nature of the divine being is to be good and orderly, and you say, well, why can't God be disorderly? Because the nature of God is to be good and orderly. And we, just because we say that God's omnipotent doesn't mean he's everything at all times, in all ways, in all circumstances. That doesn't mean that we can't say anything definitive about the nature of God. When we look at the world, we see that the world is, in fact, orderly and reasonable, and therefore, by looking at the byproduct, we can understand something of the source. Are you guys with me? Do you, do you now you get the flow? Okay. Okay. So, yeah, that's some of the ways you start to deal with these kind of, you know, accusations. So, um, there are certain theologies that, that uh, such as deism, that hold that God created the world but has absolutely positively nothing to do with it. And therefore, God's involvement in the world is irrelevant. And even though God exists, he exists so remotely from the world that there's just no need to even talk about it because for all intents and purposes, you live in an atheistic universe. Did you guys follow that? Because although God created the world, he has nothing to do with it. That's, a, that's kind of the major meaning of the word deism. There's some other kind of minor ways that the term is used, but that's the major way it's used. Accepting that, because that would be an exception, obviously, where even though God existed, he's not so important. And actually, Buddha got into some language like that, too. Buddha got into just refusing to answer certain questions, like about the nature of God or the nature of uh, an ultimate reality, because he didn't think they were germane and people needed to focus on what was right in front of them, like being good people. Stoics do this too. So this is, it's, it's a theme in philosophy. Sometimes it's because in their philosophy they're atheistic and they're trying to tell you those things are just rubbish, they don't mean any sense. It could also be because, you know, you gotta, you gotta crawl before you walk, before you run. And why talk about big highfalutin topics when you haven't even mastered the lower ones? And that becomes a big question because if they never touch it, it leaves the door open for later philosophers to say what they think those guys really thought and if they were savvy enough, they never talked about it, Sometimes you can't, you can't know. Like they asked Buddha, what happens to the Arhant? The Arhant is a pre, pre-Bodhisattva term. It's a Pali term. It's an original term. Bodhisattva is a much later term after Buddhism mixed with Hinduism in the Mahayana period. And so the original Buddhism, the oldest form of Buddhism, um, the term was Arhant which is this, this perfected being in Buddhism. Somebody asked Buddha, what happens to the Arhant when he passes, when he dies? And Buddha said, I haven't come here to talk to you about such things. <laughs> like, you know, if, why, why worry about how the fire started, you know, when, when, you're, when you have to escape from a burning building? Worry about those things later. I've come to talk to you about suffering and the cause of suffering. So Buddha would, would do stuff like that, and it leaves the door open. It leaves the door open a little bit. Um, anyway, so there are some versions of philosophy and spirituality which don't entertain the question or conceive of God as being so remote that it's irrelevant, and those even have strains 
within the Vedic literatures, such as the Mimangsikas, who said if God did exist, he has to follow the Veda. So it's irrelevant, just follow the Veda. And if God exists, then you're, you did right. And if he doesn't exist, then you did wrong. It's kind of like Pascal's Gambit, where he says if God exists and you follow him, then you go to he heaven. And if he doesn't, and if it doesn't exist, who cares? What's the big deal? And if God doesn't exist, uh, then, you know, there's no harm. But if God, if you don't follow God and he does exist, you go to hell forever. Uh, what's his name? Uh, D um, Richard Dawkins came up with Dawkins' gambit, where he reversed it. I, I, I don't find Pascal's gambit to be a particularly persuasive argument. Um, what if? I don't know. What if? I have to live my whole life worshiping God, and God doesn't exist, and, you know, that was a big waste of my time. I could have done something better with my time. So I, I disagree with his... Anyway, I, I, it's a poor argument. Whenever you can take an argument and just reverse it, Dawkins' gambit, Richard Dawkins' gambit was, you know, if God doesn't exist and you, and you like, don't believe he exists, then you won. You did a good job. And if he does exist, well, there's such a small chance, what does it really matter? You follow? So he just reverses it. These arguments, like you have a psychological need to believe in God, and you just respond back. You have a psychological need not to believe in God. You know, it's like it, a, lot of these, a lot of arguments people want to make you just, you have to have, like, the ability to just think, what if I said the opposite? Could I use the same evidence to make the opposite point? If you did, that's what you respond to them with. And if you haven't made the argument yet, and you realize it could be used exactly the opposite way, then just keep your mouth shut. Because, you know, whatever you're going to say isn't worth the air you've spoken on. You've got to provide some kind of evidence for what you want to convince people of that doesn't work equally well against your position. You guys follow this? All right. So, there are certain schools of thought that sidestep the question, don't get into it, maybe believe in a God that's so remote. But in most versions of theism, I'd say 98%, 99% of them, um, God is a the source of all existence and also the sustenance of all existence. This leads to weird questions like who allows for hell to exist? By what power does hell continue to exist? What sustains the existence of hell? If God is a, the sustaining force of all reality, that means God's like a fundamental force like gravity. A fundamental, indefatigable, permanent, all-pervasive, ultimate force of all reality that goes beyond all other forces. You follow? And is fundamentally necessary for all existence. You guys with me? Therefore, once you get into a theology, it's, that's everything. You know one thing, you know everything. You're in consonance with one thing. You're in consonance with everything. You love one thing. You love all things. You guys with me? So that move from a philosophy of do your duty, be zen, be chill, which arguably, whether or not you're a theist, is kind of irrelevant. And sometimes Christians will even go down this road. You know, you hear a good Christian theologian, um, they'll sometimes even say, you know, what meaning is there to your Christianity if you don't treat your fellow man and woman with respect? Let's focus on that before we talk about Jesus on the cross and this and that. So sometimes you'll even get like serious Protestant preachers who chastise their communities and, 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 and chide them and tell them to become good, decent people. You follow? So we make a move from, let's call it like a pre-theistic philosophy that in our case has some spirituality involved in it, but it's largely concerned with being in this world, being of this world, being like a lotus leaf, I guess being in this world but not of this world, being a little transcendental, being a little stoic, being beyond dualities. But it's, 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 
it's this sort of entry level stuff that most people think is really high. Like if you get on Oprah and start saying, you know, it's the way of no way, and you have to be in the world but not of it, and you're a soul having a human experience, and you need to learn to view pleasure and pain as two sides of the same coin. You know? Uh, and you, you say stuff like that. People are like, oh my God, it's like the deepest thing I ever heard. That's all pre-theistic. That doesn't mean it's not important. doesn't mean it's not essential. But there's a shift that took place in the seventh chapter, and we segued into theism, like a real, legitimate theism and theology, where Krishna is the taste of water, the light of the sun and the moon, the ability in man, the source and sustenance of everything that exists, the whole world depends on Krishna, like pearls are strung on a thread. That you can see Krishna everywhere, and he's also beyond this world. So we, like, we don't even get to be pantheists. Krishna bumps the hump there and does something really nifty. And then the only way you can know that source is through grace. And it's synergistic. You have to be involved in the process. It's not monergistic. Monergistic is... Uh, it's uh, John Calvin's philosophy, uh, early Protestant Christianity. It's a religion of, you know, almost two billion people. Um, it's Christianity except for the Catholics and the Orthodox. That we live in a monergistic world where really God is the one who chooses. It creates a huge problem like, why do people, you know, why, then evil becomes God's fault because we fundamentally don't have free will. By the way, if God's the source of everything, he's also the source of hell. And so you got to like do some, you got to do a little maneuvering there. Okay, well, we have free will, then we create hell. Okay, but then theoretically we could uncreate hell or we could leave hell. No, 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 hell, you're locked in. Okay, why would God lock you in forever for a thought mistake you made, for a mistake of believing the wrong thing for a very short period of time, and then you're locked into burning in a lake of fire forever? That sounds a little mean, doesn't it? And so you got to start to answer these questions. So you can make challenges about your conception of God and what's reasonable. And is, you, is your conception of God really reasonable? It's not that every challenge, some challenges are just a contradiction in terms, like God making a square circle or making a rock so big he can't lift it. You follow? Does that make sense? But then some challenges are to a particular conception of God, which is why usually when atheists want to debate with theism, they usually pick Christianity. Because it's got the most problematic conception of God on planet Earth. <laughs> you know? This super exclusivism, a dystheistic, angry, violent deity sending people to hell forever for thought crimes. It's just like... <laughs> Which is funny, because, you know, if you look at it, it's like Christianity came out of Greek philosophy, and all those early Christian guys, they were all, like, within Rome, and so they all studied Greek philosophy. The Bible's written in Greek. There's a ton of Greek philosophy in the Bible. There's a ton of Greek philosophy in the early Catholic Church. And somehow they came up with such a poor understanding of God. It was such a step down from the conception of God that was held by the ancient Greeks. I don't know, like what they were thinking, you know? They also took a major step down from the Jews. They also blew it there. Like they had some decent monotheism around their area. And they, they, they just picked such a poor form to then defend. Anyway. When atheists want to debate with Christianity, usually they'll be like, I know this argument doesn't work against all forms of theism, but it works against, you know, this conception. And, you know, they feel like if they defeated the Christians. But it's almost like if you can beat up a three-year-old, then you think you're like the heavyweight champ of the world or something like that. You got you to gotta subject yourself to some, some higher-level competition before you go, like, prancing around, claiming that, you know, you've defeated everybody. Um... So anyway, um, Krishna identifies himself as a source of all reality and really as the, the thing that holds everything together. And as the one thing 
that, that is the hub of the wheel of the universe. And then he also exists beyond the universe. So you're not even limited to pantheism. It's panentheism, everything within God. And then he throws in grace. You need his help. But then you have to also turn towards him. And then he spends some time talking about that important topic of how you turn towards him, the people who do turn towards him, people who don't turn towards him, and how you can, can begin to move in the right direction. So even Krishna, with his big highfalutin theology, spends half the chapter talking about turning towards divinity. And now you've got all this great Stoic philosophy from the first six chapters, but it's now been merged with and, 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 and married to a theology. So you don't lose anything. You still get this focus on developing yourself and being a good person and doing all the cool Oprah stuff. And you get a full-blown theology. Did you guys follow this? Right? So that's the first, that's the seventh chapter. And that leads us to where we are now. Intelligent persons who are endeavoring for liberation from old age and death take refuge in me in devotional service. Jara Marana Mokshaya. For liberation from old age and death. Mam ashritya yatanti ye. Those people who take shelter of me and strive for liberation from old age and death. You see it? It's like you want to be liberated from the material world, liberated from the. Um, you know, it's funny, this whole idea of like, you want to be liberated from old age, disease, and death. It, it, doesn't sound like, like, it doesn't sound like it's so relevant. This like intense desire to be liberated from old age, disease, and death. To transcend this world. It doesn't sound attractive. It doesn't sound relevant. Does it sound relevant to you, Gopal? Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's been my foundation. Yeah. Well, it's been your foundation for the last couple of years, or last year. Gopal's got cancer. Everybody else, we don't think we're going to die. We know we're going to die. And if somebody says to you, do you know you're going to die? We're going to go, yeah. Do you know you're going to get old? We say, yeah. But on a functional level, we don't really think about it. We're not really thinking about it. Donald Trump has a niece who's like in her 60s or whatever. And she, she said, look, you got to impeach him. You got to get rid of him. She said this yesterday. She's been talking about him for years now. That he's a, she's a therapist. So she wrote a book about it, like why he's the way he is, what his dad was like, how he's a malignant narcissist, how he's all like for all intents and purposes practically a sociopath, how he's devoid of empathy, like what he's capable of, and you know, like what a, like what what a like troubled person he is, and how much damage he's going to do to the world. She's been talking about it for years. She made her whole career on it. He's like, Trump is super bummed about her. Throws out like little hate tweets about her all the time. But not anymore. <laughs> not anymore. Trump lost his Twitter account and Facebook. He got canceled. He was still on Instagram a couple hours ago. So I, I don't know. He was still on Instagram a couple hours ago. We'll see what happens. But he lost Twitter and Facebook. He got canceled. So, um, what was the point I was making about this new? Ah, uh, thank you. Yeah, um, she was saying you have to impeach him, and she said, you know, he went uh, on on uh, he did a little two minute speech, 
where he said he condemned the uh, riots at the Capitol building. Um, and I want to talk about this anyway, so that's, that's how we got here. I'm going to justify it, make it seem like it's relevant, but I just want to talk about it. Um, uh, she said that don't believe him, it's performative. It's just for show. He has to do this. His people are telling him he has to do this, so they're all going to resign. His counsel's forcing him to do it. That's why he couldn't even read the teleprompter one time. They had to splice together his little two-minute speech because, you know, they cut out all the weird bits and make it sound smooth. And it's just, it's performative. He goes, the one who was speaking and encouraging the riots was the real Trump. And he's going to come back out again. He can't hide it. It's who he is. So I think for most people, I think for most people, um, we give lip service to the idea that we're going to die and grow old. But we're like Trump. We're just pretending. We don't actually believe it. Because if we did actually believe it, our life wouldn't be nearly as sexy and fun. We've got this deep-rooted conviction that we're going to enjoy the material world, that we're going to make it, that we're going to figure it out. And therefore, we live in a largely atheistic universe, even if we officially say we believe in God. It's a functional atheism that most people live in accord with. And for most people, what it takes to actually think and live and sit with these deeper topics is they have to get sick and die. Like Gopal, you're looking all sadhu. You're thinking about all sorts of spiritual stuff. But I don't know. I don't have that much faith. Let's say you, let's say you beat cancer. And three, four years from now, you're like on cloud nine, healthier than ever. I don't know that you're deep thoughtfulness and introspection will long endure and will stay like it is now. I don't know that that's the case. We have this thing called Shmasan Bhairagya, crematorium renunciation, that when you go to the funeral and you're watching the body burn, Burning bodies are gnarly. In India, they burn bodies, like right away. You die in the morning, they burn you by night. You die at night, they burn you in the morning. You got to put a lot of wood around the head because the brain explodes and like brain juice comes out. So you can pack out of wood so it's not like an actual like bomb. And you got to step back. You can't stand near the body. At a certain point, you got to go and like, you got to go and mash the skull like break it down so it all burns nicely. So like your dad dies, you got to go mash his skull so it's like brain can boil and cook and pack a bunch of wood around his head and, and then like eventually go and like mash up his bones. Like the day after he dies. So everybody is super sadhu on that day. Nobody wants to watch the footy game, uh, the, the soccer game. Nobody, want, nobody wants to, like, you know, watch Dancing with the Stars. Nobody's talking about makeup. Everybody's really sober. And then a few days go by and everybody goes back to normal. People die, everybody gets real somber. And then they go back to normal. I've had a bunch of people die. Bunch of people die. 
People die in front of me. You just can't live in that reality. It's too paralyzing. The truth of it's too paralyzing. It's the fundamental lie we tell ourselves on the, on the daily so that we can function and get up and stay motivated to make it in this world. Because otherwise we lose all of our impetus and we become lethargic and depressed. I was reading one, one psychologist whose opinion was that people who struggle with depression oftentimes lack the ability to live in the illusion that most people can live in. <laughs> they don't have the ability to tell themselves a lie that everybody else will be able to successfully tell themselves. So, in the same way that Trump's performance was merely performative and not at all demonstrative of where he's actually at. I mean, he even went and goes, like, we love you, you're special, to the rioters. Like, he couldn't help himself. He got off so much. And by the way, here's the other thing is, whatever, man. They rioted at the Capitol building. You know what? Those Capitol police should have had their crap together. You kidding me? You shoot a few rioters, the whole thing's over. People, they push because they see you're going to allow them to push. If you're armed and, and, and you're out in force and you, and you make it clear that they're not going to breach your gates, you, anyway, this gets into the whole castle law, but you have to have a defensible position. The Capitol building is a defensible position. Then you have to fight to defend that position and you can't let it get flanked and breached. Just like you can't let your enemy get behind you. That's why you, you, in guerrilla warfare, you flank your enemy, you get behind them. And then you, we're not designed to fight behind us. We're designed to fight in front of us. Our tools, all of our weapons, are designed to protect against danger which comes from the front. We have no tools to protect against danger which comes from behind. That's true to a person. It's also true with any kind of military formation. Then you have property, and that's where you get castle laws. And that's why you can shoot somebody if they come into your house. You don't have to retreat. Castle laws, in effect. You don't have to retreat. You can stand your ground when you're in your home. And so when you have a, for, a fortification, when you have a, a building, you don't have to defend it on all sides. It has to be built to be defended on all sides because enemies can come from any side. That's why castles are built on hilltops. Because to get to them, you have to climb the hill. And while you're climbing the hill, they're killing you. And when, you, when you're climbing the walls, they're pouring, burning, boiling oil, and they're shooting arrows at you, and they're dropping stones on you. And you have this massive disadvantaged position that you have to overcome because they have the high ground. You follow this? This is just like, this is just for all time, <laughs> the way it's done. That's why the Great Wall of China was built. It's just the way, the way it's done. They succeeded where Trump failed. They built a big wall. Um, but if you have that kind of fortification and you don't defend it, then people just start pushing. And if you don't push back, they just keep pushing. And then you've got to shoot them in the neck. Whereas if you were just super aggro from the beginning, and the National Guard offered to come in, and, 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 and the Fed offered to come in, and fortify and, and, and uh, augment the capital troops. The capital troops, they had 2,300 capital troops. They're defending that like two square mile radius. They got 4,000 police officers in the whole city of Washington, D.C., or whatever it is. It's like a republic or something like that, whatever it is. And so, you know, some special thing it is. I don't know what it is. But when the whole city has 4,000 cops. They have 2,300 cops just doing the Capitol grounds. They have a huge police force. And the National Guard offered to come in. And federal police offered to come in as well. They could have a bunch of federal officers in as well. They said no thanks. And they, they weren't out. 
enforced because there's a bunch of white people and they weren't as scared and they weren't as freaked out and they took a couple selfies and you know then by the time they started getting overrun they were too like when the, by the time they really started to go psycho it was too it was too late they got overrun and they took charge of the building it was just it was like really embarrassing i mean like like what how do we look on the international stage you know My airports are more secure. <laughs> we have more control over our airports all over the country because of 9-11 than we do over our capital with all the senators. Like our like entire legislative body is meeting there. Anyway, so I was totally underwhelmed with the weak, the weak display of force by our police. And... Uh, it was tragic, actually. Yeah, it was tragic, actually. Um, but, I mean, really, was this surprising? It wasn't surprising to me. And there have been, like, calls for violence been going on for months and months now, years. Heavy conspiracy theorists, people who are really into the Second Amendment and carrying guns around in public as much as possible. They're getting, they're getting uh, um, riled up by the President of the United States who has, you know, 24-7 access to them through social media. And then he gave them like a Hitler-esque speech and a call to arms just an hour before. We're going to march down Pennsylvania Avenue. We're going to walk down Pennsylvania. I love Pennsylvania Avenue. We're going to all walk down together. I'm going to be with you. And you can never overcome weakness except with strength. And we're going to cheer on the strong senators. And then we're, going to, we're, we're not going to be cheering for the weak senators. And let's all go. I mean, he like, it was, it was crystal clear what was happening. So I wasn't surprised at all what, like what happened. And whatever, we lost a few people. We lost thousands of people due to COVID. It was the worst COVID death total in the history of the country. A lot more people died of COVID. It's just sensational. Like you look at that and you're like, oh, like, you know, those people died, ignoring the fact that thousands of people died from starvation. Thousands of people died from COVID. Police officers died elsewhere in the country on that day, defending the Constitution. Other people died, had medical emergencies. But it was, it was clear, like, something bad was going to happen, and they should have been out there. It was, like, way worse than the BLM protest back in July. They should have way more freaked out of, like, the white gun-toting Americans. They're a way more dangerous species. So I, I wasn't surprised. It was kind of like a fitting end. Actually, it probably worked out for the Democrats. Trump lost a ton of respectability. You got Republican senators now saying they don't know if they can stay with the party. You got a bunch of senators calling for his resignation. They're going to try to impeach him again. I don't know how much you guys know about impeachment. There's two ways to remove a president. Uh, Mike Pence can get the majority of his cabinet and they can remove him. That's one, that's one vehicle. That's the 25th Amendment. Then you've got the impeachment process, which the House of Representatives can impeach him, which they will do because the Democrats have the House. That's what they did in that 2019. Then it goes to the Senate. But you require a two-thirds vote of the Senate, which is 67 senators, which they're never going to get. They're never going to convince 17 Republican senators. They'll get, ha they'll get half a dozen, maybe... 10. They'll never get 17. And so it'll fail. They can impeach him after he leaves, and then they can stop him from ever being president again. But I, it seems like he's on his way out. His, his influence is waning. And then they nabbed his Twitter account, which is going to really freak him out. And then they also uh, got his Facebook account, so they're trying to go over to Parler. 
but now Google won't show, or Apple won't show Parler. Parler is some kind of uh, alternative social media site for right-wing people. And so, you know, they're going to try and make a move. Trump wants to start his own Twitter thing. He was saying that he wants his own platform. But he's so, like, big on Twitter. And so he's, like, he's bombed. He has 88 million followers. And they're just gone overnight. Because it's a private company. And, I mean, Twitter's more powerful than the government. I mean, they can just silence you. Just, you're gone. Like, it's just, like, unbelievable the amount of power social media has. And so that's a, that's a whole other thing. I mean, man, are those, like, it's like a monopoly. So much power. Amazon, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. I mean, Facebook and Instagram are the same thing. But there's so much power to influence people. It's unbelievable what they can do. Yeah, he made a second Twitter account. They deleted that. He also started po posting stuff from the POTUS account. And they just deleted it instantly. Like, I guarantee you, they have people who simply are scouring the internet all day long to see where Trump is going to poke his head out, and then they're just going to cut it off. Like a hydra. Guaranteed. That's what's going on. They have a whole little department of people. You know? That that's their job. Is to just... And, I mean, they own the internet, so they can do whatever they... they can Instantly, and they, they, just, they can just spot him wherever he tries to rear his ugly head. And just... Snip him. He's castrated. It's like a castrated animal. Um, anyway. <laughs> I think we're all functional atheists. And we're all living in a fantasy world. And the seventh chapter of the Gita, it, it, it really changes things because it introduces theism as a fundamental bedrock of reality. And Krishna really means that he's the taste of water, the light of the sun and the moon, the ability of man, the source of all desire. And that everything which exists depends on him in every moment. If you really accept that, then you have to make loving God and worshiping God and connecting with God and communing with God, the major feature of your life. Like, that's who you are. C.S. Lewis, with his book, Mere Christianity, that I like to quote sometimes. Um, that's what that statement, if you find in yourself a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the best explanation is that you were made for something beyond this world. Um, uh, C.S. Lewis, he said, you know, we should just be merely Christian. We shouldn't be Christian activists and Christian philanthropists and Christian industrialists. We should be merely Christian. That was, that's, that's been what happens to people when they have this, when they get radicalized. When they get radicalized. So the problem isn't getting radicalized. The problem is getting radicalized into a theology that tells you to go and kill people. <laughs> That's the problem. You follow? Becoming deeply religious so that religion and spirituality becomes what you do with your life and the only thing that matters. That's where all serious spirituality leads you. To an absolute commitment that this is who I am, this is what I do, this is what's valuable. Because the very nature of the spiritual ideal is that there's one thing, there's one thing that's everything. There's one thing you can do that fixes everything. There's one thing that's eternal, that's forever. That is your core. It's who you are forever. You're a lover of God. You're a servant of God. You're a communer with God. That idea is so dangerous and radical and subversive and all-encompassing and dramatic and powerful and earth-shattering that it controls everything else. 
Which is why when Krishna embarks on theology in this chapter, it immediately becomes, and everything is connected to me. And because it's a personal conception of deity, then there's grace and there's love and there's intimacy as a, like a fundamental feature of reality that is a powerful force. It's like gravity. It's actually something that you can hold on to and anchor yourself to. But that idea is too big. It's too big. It's like, you know, the natives see the plane. They can't see it because it's just beyond their ability to fathom. They didn't see the ships when Cortez landed because the idea of ships was just so beyond their reality they couldn't see it. Our, our reason why uh, optical illusions work is because our brain is designed to see patterns because we have to see patterns in order to survive because we have to be able to quickly like, look at mass amounts of information and determine patterns so that we can move forward. And so then when you interrupt that pattern, we don't notice it because your brain skips over it. So this idea is such a pattern interrupt that we just... We can't contend with it. And so we, you know, we say, yeah, I believe in Krishna, or I chant my rounds every day, or whatever, but we live the vast majority of our waking hours and our sleeping hours not thinking about Krishna. Not thinking about what really matters. We let what matters most become a servant of what matters least. We anchor ourselves to the fallible soldiers of friends and family, of society, friendship, and love. And we ignore death knocking at our door. And we waste our precious time in this world. Like someone who is going to be forced to leave a house they've been living in and they just try not to think about it and they play video games. You're going to get kicked out at the end of the day. They're coming. The sheriffs are coming for you. The sheriffs are going to evict you. And you're just playing video games. Try not to think about it. And stuff happens, and you have to think about it for five seconds, and you go back. Like the, this, the, like the Capitol building, thing, that thing was guaranteed. That was guaranteed. Like, it's not like some kind of, like astrologers, like, oh, I could see it in the stars. You, you, you have a half a brain, you could see it coming. It was obvious that was what was going to happen. Trump at the National Mall just down the road, telling people to march in the Capitol building while he's sworn he's going to fight it, and Pence is going to defend him, and they're going to... Like, it's so funny, like, they have to defend the Constitution. Like, like, how does defending the Constitution mean overthrowing the government and, like, establishing a dictatorship and going against the legitimate vote? Like, how does that, like, become... It's like a weird little euphemistic, kind of, like, little sleight of hand. Like, they got to defend the Constitution. One guy was like, we, Trump won the election. I'm like, no, he didn't. Like, well, if you don't count California... <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, whew, like, well, I, uh, like, how do people do that, you know? You know what I mean? Like, you, you know, it's like you memorize a few words, you repeat these little, like, memes to yourself, these little, like, myths to yourself, and you create this little euphemistic world you live in where you don't really do the math. And so that's like, a, that's the polarized world we live in. And you're going to see this stuff happening. Fortunately, all those right-wing, spastic conspiracy theorists, fortunately, they're just like all of us. They got short attention spans, and they're materialists. 
And so this ideal that they've embraced, this deity of Trump and with their cult of QAnon, it won't long endure. He lost his Twitter feed. It's like, like start watching cartoons or something. You know? Go in the backyard and shoot some tin cans. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, it's like, it's, 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 it also, you know, it also works on that, on that level too. And so, in the same way, people just have a hard time holding on to an ideal, living a life of consequence, having integrity, valuing something and living their life valuing that. And most of us are just into these quiet lives of desperation, worshiping at the altar of materialism. Sex, money, those are most people's deities. And so sex in all of its iterations, from actual sex, like to romance, to the byproducts of sex and romance, which is a family, and like that just becomes a reality. And then money, this promise that if I just earn enough and I just make my moves, I'll be happy. And you can be a hoarder if you save enough, or you can be a gambler if I, if I gamble enough and start enough businesses, whatever your persuasion is, whether you got the hoarding persuasion or the gambling persuasion, doesn't really make a difference. You're both worshiping at the altar of money. And so we're a bunch of functional atheists. And these aren't them. Intelligent people who are endeavoring for liberation from old age and death take refuge in devotional service. They actually want to be released from old age and death. They get it. And so they can take shelter of me. They can strive towards me. That is required for making a real serious inquiry into spirituality. That's required to make a real serious endeavor in spirituality. You have to remember that you're going to die. It's like memento mori. You have to remember death. You have to remember this world is, not, is a temporary place. You have to remember this is not your home. You have to remember that you're meant for more than this. You have to have a bigger yes that allows you to remember the smaller things that you need to let go of. The phantasmagoric promises, the will-o'-the-wisp promises, the fake promises, the phantom promises. And we have to chase in our minds. The same way you work out. Who am I? Why am I here? What's the purpose of life? I'm a soul. I'm not this body. This material world is not ultimately my home. Material enjoyment is not going to make me happy. It's like you get some jacked up person and then they go and get a romantic relationship. And they're just as messed up as they ever were. They're just now in a relationship and things are way more, like way more dangerous. You gotta get right with yourself. If you don't love yourself, if you haven't squared yourself away, how are you gonna square things away with somebody else? This idea that happiness is an inside job. That happiness is within my control. That this material world is not my home. That I'm meant for something greater. That is the precursor to theism. And then theism is a positive conception about who you are and what you're built for and what life's really about. And then you gotta anchor yourself to that and you have to live your life in accord with that. And it's subversive, it's radicalized, it's different, it's the road less traveled, it's idealistic, it's romantic, it's beautiful, it's the hero's journey, it's everything you ever wanted and it actually delivers. Te Brahma Tatvidu Kritsnam Adhyatma Karma Chaki Lam. They are actually Brahman because they entirely know everything about transcendental activities. The people who strive towards divinity actually get it.
They know karma. They know what binds you to this world. They know Brahman. They know spirit. And they know adhyatma. They know the self. We need to commit. We need to become radicalized. Not like Muslim jihadists but like people who are deeply committed and fundamentally committed to looking in their own hearts, cleaning out our own hearts, and loving Krishna. That's the real revolution. Unless Fidel Castro is smoking cigars like a loser. Like, you know? That's the real revolution. And because we're addicted, Rene Descartes says, the senses sometimes deceive you. And once somebody deceives you once, you should never trust them again, completely. Just like a drug addict. You have to tell a drug addict, or somebody with borderline personality disorder. You have to tell them, part of the therapy is telling them not to take themselves so seriously. I know you really feel intensely about this. But just don't take yourself so seriously. That's part of the therapy. Drug addicts, when they're detoxing, they just have to chill. It goes away. Detoxing from drugs, the come down from drugs, can be brutal. None of you know. I don't think any of you know. The come down from drugs can be like, like torturous. Like your body and mind are writhing in pain. And there's just no solution other than to put on a straitjacket, have somebody throw you in a cell somewhere or a room tie you up and just and you just sweat it out and deal with it and suffer we're addicted to materialism we don't believe in god functionally and we should make it our life's work to embrace spirituality for real then the comings and goings of this world will be very easy for us to remain Zen. We'll be able to keep our heads when everybody else is losing theirs. We'll be able to stay above the breach. We'll be able to keep our heads above the fray. Without that, you're just on the roller coaster ride of materialism up and down, political movements, and romance, and family, and sickness and health. And poverty and wealth and just up and down and up and down. You know, if, you, if you live long enough, there's a, there's a saying, if you live long enough, all your victories will turn into defeats. <laughs> if you live long enough, all your victories will turn into defeats. That Realism, that uncomfortable, unpleasant, I don't want to think about it too much realism, is what we have to embrace for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And unlike Trumpism and really lousy spirituality with dystheistic notions of divinity and, and you know, poorly thought out theologies of blind faith, We've actually got, got a tradition which can hold your attention span for life. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's what this first, the, the chapter is about theology. The chapter is about when you start to see that God is connected to everything. And this last verse is about the nature of people who are able to strive towards Krishna. Yatanta means like they're striving. They're striving towards Krishna. They're taking shelter of Krishna. They're taking shelter, ashritya, and they're striving. Yatanta, synergistic. They're working, 
and they're taking shelter. It's the perfect mix of grace and hard work. It's the perfect mix of justice and mercy. It's what good theology looks like. It's all those earlier chapters of the Gita seamlessly married to these beautiful notions of divinity. And you find it all in this one verse. Knowledge of theology provides you with a platform that you can then use, like, like substance. It provides you with like tools that you can then use to immerse yourself in spirituality. These are tools. They're actually valuable. If you're serious about spirituality and living a life of spirituality, you look at these things, you're like, these are tools. I can use these things. These will remind me. And then we can steal ourselves for overcoming our addiction to materialism. And then we're heroes. And that's the revolution. And it's just like, it's just, anyway, it's, it's actually like Turnabout's Fair Play. We've been like criticizing dictatorships and banana republics for so long. And we ended when that when an elected a dictator. Like at least these other countries, the dictator has to have a junta and take power and cheat to get in power. We're so stupid, we elected a malignant narcissist. You follow? Like, we're like the laughing stock of the planet. Like, we thought, I was embarrassed when Bush was, was president. It was, like, embarrassing. And he got elected for two terms. I was like, man, like, what's wrong with you people? Like, that's how dumb you are. Most of us don't travel, but you travel. People are, like, mocking you. Like, you're an American. You elected Bush. You're an idiot. And you're like, it's like, it's like a big guy. Like, hang your head now. Pretend you're British or something like that. Try and talk with an accent. And... But Trump makes Bush look like a saint. Like a real pious, saintly person. And now we're like the dumbest people on the planet because we elected that idiot. It's like they elected Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan is a movie of him with a, with a, with a monkey. He's living with a chimpanzee. There's a movie of him in the 60s where he like a chimp adopts a chimpanzee. He's like living with a chimpanzee. The guy was like a cheesy Hollywood actor, like a full cheesy Hollywood actor. We elected him. Then the Terminator became the, 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 like, the, the, the governor of California. Like, what is the deal? Like, why, so, well, since when does being a, a, an actor or a bodybuilder qualify you to, to run a government? That was embarrassing. Tito Ortiz. That's like the, 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 the we just keep, we keep like the, the ground keeps like getting pulled out from under me. He's now like, like a, a council member in Huntington Beach. It's like it keeps coming closer to home. It's like we elect an actor and it's like the governor of California. He's like in Huntington Beach. It's like, it's like it keeps getting closer to home. It's like I think, I'm starting to think I'm the problem. And then and then, and then, yeah, I'm gonna, uh, Kanye next, you know? He's running. And then, uh, um, and then we elected Trump. Like, like, a, like a rapist. I, actually, you know, it's, it's sad, but anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for going on, but I'm just gonna make this final point. It's not that we're a, a nation of, 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 of idiots. The problem is people are just so damn fed up with bureaucracy and, and everybody lying through their teeth and nothing changes that when Trump, who's a, a braggart and, 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 and uh, a materialist and, and ostentatious and unapologetic and rude and crude, at, at least he seems authentic. And it's a way of showing your rebellion. It's not like QAnon. It's not like the whole Red Sea is QAnon. It's a relatively small amount of the Red Sea. 
I'd say probably at this point it's some hundreds of thousands of people, maybe even some millions, but it's definitely not like, it's not the majority of the people who vote Republican. It's not the 75 million people are not QAnon conspiracy theorists. It's in the hundreds of thousands to millions. And so, but I think for a lot of people, it was like they wanted something authentic. They wanted somebody who was just going to talk to them straight. They wanted somebody who was not another Democrat, not Hillary Clinton. You know, we, we gave him Bernie Sanders, who's like, his, his campaign slogan was a revolution is coming. I mean, who's going to vote for that? We want stability in this country. People don't want a revolution. We're not like a Latin American country. It's, it's like, you know what I mean? And so, I mean, forgive me. <laughs> that was rude to say, but we're not, you know, people aren't looking for a revolution in this country. It's like Canada, the Canadian, Canada. You know, going to win on the platform of a revolution is coming. This isn't, this, isn't, this isn't Cuba in the, in the 60s. Um, so, yeah. Um, we got what we deserved. We're a bunch of closet materialists, too. We should be looking at that. I can't fix Trump. I can fix myself. I can't deal with his rampant materialism and narcissism. I can deal with my own, though. I can't deal with other people's lack of ability to think logically. I can deal with my own, though. I can start to do the math. Anyway, these are some of the things I was thinking about. Thank you guys very much for listening. We'll talk to you all soon. Hare Krishna.